Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Brilliant. So, the end of 2022 and the start of 2023 has been a very rough time for Disney+, Plus, one of the world's largest streaming services, shedding millions of users and starting a troubling trend for what had been a pretty steady upwards climb. The immediate knee-jerk reaction to this is probably pretty predictable. Is it Marvel fatigue? People upset over Star Wars? Well, the more you look into it, the more complicated this answer becomes. And most importantly, it shows some of the growing problems facing these large streaming services going forward, not just Disney+. Plus. So that's what I want to discuss this week. And sorry if my audio is a little weird, I am recording from the road, but I really just wanted to get into it. So one thing that needs to be mentioned right near the start here is that the biggest reason for this sudden drop in Disney Plus subscribers had nothing to do with superheroes or lightsabers, but sports. Late last year, Disney Plus lost the rights to the Indian Premier League, the biggest cricket league in India, and something that had been a massive driver of growth for them. Now, I've never actually watched cricket, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on it, or the nation of India for that matter, but it's clear that losing this hugely popular league did lead to an outsized drop in subscribers in the country and in Southeast Asia in general. So when looking at that staggering drop in subscribers, it does really have to be acknowledged. But that also doesn't mean that everything would be going fantastic if it weren't for cricket. And here's where we get to a lot of issues with streaming that aren't just unique to Disney+. Plus. One of the looming issues is pretty simple. These big streamers are no longer the exciting upstarts that they once seemed to be. In the early 2010s, and maybe even until a few years ago, streaming felt like a pretty unbeatable deal. It was often ad-free and much cheaper than cable. And the libraries were pretty impressive too, with all sorts of studios and distributors, filling Netflix's catalog, and at least in the US, multiple TV networks and cable channels putting their shows up on Hulu. Back then, it really felt like it was possible that anything could wind up on those services. Today, that model has changed completely. The early 2010s dream of almost everything the average person would want to watch being in one place is long dead, and there's probably no better example of that than Disney Plus itself. Instead of being a big, broad service that has something for everyone, it really specializes in a few of Disney's big brands, especially when it comes to producing originals, which heavily rely on Marvel and Star Wars. And even many of their productions outside of those rely on old Disney IP, from High School Musical to the Proud Family revival. Now, this is a little less the case outside of the US, where Hulu barely exists and tons of like FX shows are accessible through the service, a bunch of movies, but it's pretty safe to say that the big brands are its bread and butter. And they're hardly alone in that. Look at a service like Paramount Plus, which has really doubled down on Star Trek and Yellowstone. Maybe more than any of the others, those two seem laser focused on a few of their biggest properties. It's an understandable strategy, as big brand names like this can cut through the constant noise and actually get some attention, something it's increasingly difficult for new shows to do. But it also comes with a pretty big downside. Like, sorry to state the obvious here, but the MCU and Star Wars are known as film franchises first and foremost. And any shows that they make in those universes at least have to try to reach some kind of movie level visuals. Modern Star Trek also seems dead set on looking a lot more like the J.J. Abrams movies than the old shows. And what all of that adds up to is fairly short but very expensive television. The days of Star Trek The Next Generation or Enterprise running for over 20 weeks a year is very far behind us. Instead, a show like Star Trek Strange New Worlds will run for 10 episodes, and some Star Wars shows, like The Mandalorian Season 3, is only managing 8. And after those very short windows, many subscribers are more than happy to save some money and cancel the service until next season. All of that builds into a problem that haunts almost all of these services, from Disney Plus to Netflix to Peacock and basically everyone else, subscriber churn. Where 10 years ago, many would be happy to just keep their Netflix subscriptions year round, the sheer amount of big streaming services has encouraged more of a revolving door approach. As subscribers sign up, watch the thing they wanted, and then cancel, and maybe subscribe to a different service for a while instead. With the sheer amount of services, and the prices on those services constantly going up these past few years, of course many people are going to opt for doing just that. 
But for Disney Plus and the others, that means that the subscriber number, the thing that's always measured their success, just doesn't mean quite as much as it used to. It ebbs and flows. And of course, almost all of these big services have lost money, usually a lot of it, with Disney Plus reporting well over a billion dollars in losses last year. Now, that was always part of the plan, lose money for a while to make a lot of it in the long term. And they do seem better positioned to do that than, say, NBC Universal's Peacock, which is still struggling to gain subscribers. But it does seem like the days of these companies being okay with stomaching massive losses is quickly coming to an end, with many of them, including Disney+, Plus, having to resort to mass layoffs. Basically, with streaming services on this scale, there's one massive problem that they can't get around. In the words of a consulting service quoted by The Hollywood Reporter, Gone are the revenues enjoyed during the cable TV era, which formerly approached those of the global energy sector. By some estimates, streaming generates one-sixth as much revenue per home as pay TV. In addition, audiences are fragmented, canceling subscriptions is easy, content has only become more expensive to acquire and produce. I think that, more than anything, is what lies at the heart of Disney Plus's problems. As easy as it would be to narrow things down to the MCU Phase 4 being a disappointment or the Boba Fett show being terrible or whatever, the issue with the service is just so much bigger than any of that. It's that the Netflix model, the model that services like Disney Plus grew out of, just isn't a profitable one, especially when so many are attempting it. To quote that article one more time, Rather than being the new sliced bread, investors and executives have accepted that streaming is, in fact, not a good business, at least not compared to what came before. A common complaint I hear is that these large streaming services are becoming more and more like cable, and there's a pretty good reason for that. Cable television actually made money. If you want to read the whole thing, I'll leave a link to that article down below in the description. But where does that leave the future of Disney Plus? Well, obviously, I can really only guess, but I do think we have some indications. Since its inception, in the US at least, advertising has been the financial backbone of TV. Ad tiers are already popping up everywhere, with even Disney Plus and Netflix starting to add them, something that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. I know many people won't be thrilled to hear this, but I really do think that the future of streaming looks a lot like the past of cable TV but maybe with a lot more modern convenience. Just look at the rise of services like Pluto TV and Amazon's Freevee. These are known as free ad-supported streaming television, or fast services. These function a lot like older TV, even to the point of having linear channels that play on them live with ad breaks, in addition to having a lot of shows and movies on demand. They're far cheaper to run than the Disney Pluses of the world, with many of them, like Pluto TV, not even creating originals. Where services like Disney Plus and Netflix count on flashy and expensive new shows to garner eyeballs and attention, most of these fast services have been far more conservative with spending, relying on linear channels that play old favorites like Frasier, CSI, and Doctor Who. The classic shows and familiar, cable-like setup are attractive to older viewers, while the fact that it's free attracts a lot of cash-strapped young people. I'm not saying that fast services are some streaming silver bullet, and I'm pretty sure that many will prefer paying for a streaming service over them, but I do think we're going to see things like Fox's Tubi continue to grow and do better than, say, NBC Universal's Peacock. And I wouldn't be surprised if Freevee becomes a more and more important part of Amazon's streaming business while spending on Prime shows goes down. As for Disney, they don't have a fast service to call their own, at least not yet. But with their massive libraries of ABC, ESPN, and of course, Marvel and Star Wars and Pixar, I wouldn't be surprised to see them dip their toe into this kind of service soon. Whatever happens, I'd be pretty shocked if the Disney streaming service of 2026 looks all that much like Disney Plus does now. Because what these big streaming services are doing now just isn't working. Losing billions of dollars was acceptable when streaming television was the exciting far off future. But now, it's the mundane present. I think the free ride is kind of over. To become profitable, these services may have to embrace looking a lot more like cable in 2007 and a lot less like present-day Netflix. But how that will work out is anybody's guess. 
So I may have some issues with TV on the internet, but learning online has never been better, thanks to things like calculus in a nutshell on Brilliant. It may sound intimidating, but this course actually starts with concrete and simple examples and helps you build your calculus skills from there. It's really never too late to build your base of knowledge in STEM skills, whether it's for a future job down the line or for the sheer pleasure of learning, all built around your own schedule. That's where Brilliant shines, helping you tackle math, computer science, and science concepts in a highly interactive way. There's thousands of lessons here, with new ones being added constantly, and spending just 30 minutes or so a day on them is both fun and builds our skills without any of the stress that you might remember associating with a lot of these topics. Plus with Brilliant, you can really learn and dig into this stuff without breaking the bank or taking out some giant loan. So go to brilliant.org slash midnight and get a 30 day free trial. And also the first 200 people to go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.